Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to your Monday edition of the Trader Merlin Show. Hope you had a great weekend. Um, for my football fans out there, what a great weekend watching those Cowboys get knocked off by the Cardinals. Anyway, uh, today's topic is going to revolve around bonds. I know, we talked a bit about that at the tail end of last week, but today we did reach a milestone with that 10-year, kind of as expected. I know many of you have been following the show. We talk about, or at least I've been saying how I expect this 10-year to keep on rising as it, it just needs to keep up with the supply that the government is selling, or at least the, the Treasury Department is selling to cover all of our debt. So that's our topic for today is going to be at least breaking bonds. We'll look at what's going on in that 10-year space, what that might mean for the markets going forward. It really was not a good thing that we broke through that 450 mark today just because it's such a psychological overhead number. From that perspective, at least in my opinion, you've got about, about almost 20 basis points before we get to the next milestone. And after that, you're going all the way up to 521. And again, as Big Ed was saying, we might see 8% on that 30-year fixed rate mortgage by the end of the year. That will definitely have an impact on our market. So let me start there and work our way backwards. I'll, don't worry, I'll do our top eight markets as well. Let's go through uh, two, I think two questions that came in. Of course, for those of you who might be new, you can always put your comments down below any of the YouTube videos or you can email me at tradermerlin at gmail.com. All right, uh, let's see. So here's our, our 10 year, this is on the weekly time frame. And the reason I brought this one up, hey Rob, good to see you from across the pond. A little late night over there. What is it? Uh, it's 10 or 11 p.m. over there for you? Well, thanks for staying up. Late night television here. Um, yeah, you look right here. We've had that red line at 4.51. And let me zoom into the daily just so we can start there and then work our way to the bigger picture. I know, talking bonds with no Bill Addis. It's a tough one. It's a tough one. I'm, I'm kind of frustrated with that myself, but I can only get them on maybe once a month. Um, if you look at what happened last week, right, we hit that 5 point, or sorry, 4.51, just barely tiptoed into the 4.5%, but then we sold off and closed lower going into Friday's session. Well, today is interesting because we ripped through it. We're holding above it right now, so we officially have a close above 4.5% for the 10-year. Now, I know it isn't as significant as, let's say, the price of Intel or Apple or Cisco breaking through a quote-unquote supply zone. However, there's psychological impacts here, and I do believe that it has a similar uh, impact when people look and say, oh, it's still holding above four and a half. The longer it'll stay at these higher levels, the more likely it will continue to go higher because normally when things are moving up, you get those little pullbacks in price. We're just not getting that with that tenure. So all in all, this is looking very bullish for anybody who uh, is looking to buy bonds. You're going to get some higher yields for yourself, although uh, I would still encourage you to buy the short term just because well, short term is paying you more right now unless you feel that over the next 10 years or so, rates are going to fall on the long end significantly and you're happy getting 4.5%. So <laughs> That's right, Ben. I did. I no, no. I'm definitely not a pro. I know. I never put that uh, that tag of arrogance on my head. I, I don't consider myself pro of anything. I'm always a student. Will always be learning. You know, there's there's things we brought up last week. Um, a couple things you guys emailed me on as well. I learned some stuff as well from you. So I'm always learning. I don't consider myself a pro. I just do what I do. So looking at, on the weekly, right? We mentioned how bullish this daily time frame is. If I look at that weekly. It looks very strong and bullish. Of course, we're running into some issues we had back here in 2007. I know, 16 plus years ago, crazy. So let me go to the monthly so it's a little cleaner for us. Zoom out. And this is our picture. This is on a monthly time frame. So obviously this is looking way, way out there, big picture. But you can see why I've got that 5.2 mapped out, right? That was this double top that went all the way back into May of 2006, double tapping in May of 2007. And we are quickly approaching that. Now, what's, again, noteworthy in my opinion is just the speed of some of these candles here for a monthly basis, showing you how much that yield has increased over the period of 30 days or 28 days or whatever month it is. That is what's concerning. And, you know, the Fed has made that point. I actually wrote down uh, every press conference. I write down the different comments and things that they say. And as I mentioned the last time, Jerome Powell said, uh, we have yet to feel the full impact from some of our most recent rate hikes. Well, that's because they're still filtering through and we are going to hit those here soon. <laughs> I don't need us. It's uh, it's funny you say that because part of the, 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 the chapters of my book, um, it, it really is a distinction between needs and wants, right? In life, we have all these things that we want, but we don't necessarily need. Now, I don't necessarily need Bill Addis on the show, but do I want him on the show? Oh, heck yeah, I do. Heck yeah, I do. We'll get him on here again soon, absolutely. Uh, I know he's now busy doing his uh, signature or his focus class, which I'm pretty excited about. So 
Is the bond market leading the Fed? No. No, I would say that, in, in, in essence, I would say that the, the, the Fed is leading the bond market, right? I would say that because the Fed has now raised that short end of that yield curve so unbelievably high, the long end now has to catch up. And I think we remember, I made the point that there's really only two distinct possibilities of things that could happen. Let me see if, if there's two. Um, and let me bring up that animated yield curve again just so we can look at that picture real quick. Sorry, I, I should have this thing bookmarked because I use it so often on this show. I should send them royalty checks because it is such a great tool just to kind of see the picture here. So here's our yield curve. I'll bring your screens over there in just a second. And on the left-hand side is what we're looking at. Not the S&P 500 on the right, just the yield curve on the left. Only a couple of things could happen here. Number one, the left-hand side of this chart here drops significantly. We get back down to 3%, 2%. Well, we know that that is absolutely not going to happen, at least for the next year. Why? Well, because the Fed controls this left side, right? The Fed controls that, and they've been raising that one higher and higher and higher. So the higher that goes, the, the bigger problems there is for the long end of the yield curve. So option number one is that the short end, meaning the left-hand side, drops significantly, and then we get back to a normal-looking yield curve. I, I think that that's an absolute long shot. The Second option here is that the long end of the yield curve starts to move up and then we get back to a normal yield curve. Now, granted, the curve would be very high because of the overall rate situation, but um, that's the only other way we get back to a normal yield curve because this short end is not going to change for another year. Um, if it does, it's going to be like 25 basis points. It won't be an aggressive cut. So the way that we see this long end of this yield curve rise, meaning the right-hand side of this, this chart on my left, um, the way we see that rise is the government is going to have to pay more money to borrow money. So we're lenders, right? When you buy that 10-year bond, you're a lender and you're locking in your money for 4.5% right now. As of today, yes, I get a 10-year, I get 4.5%. And then as um, you know, Big Ebbs puts in the chat right there, he says, yeah, but why would I lock my money up for four for 10 years for four and a half percent when I can get one full percentage point higher I can get five and a half percent for a 13 year work 13 week t-bill I mean that, that's just a simple no-brainer for anybody who's looking at investments so right now those 10 years are undesirable right who really wants to buy those 10 years now certainly there's big macroeconomic pieces that governments around the world and central banks might be using those 10 years and that's that that certainly is a factor but it would lead me to believe that you're going to get more purchasing on that short end by people because the yields are better so what's going to have to happen to make those 10 years more desirable those yields are going to have to rise and most likely that higher um, yield is going to bring in a little bit more demand for those 10 years, which should help out as well. So that's, to me, that's the problem. That's where we are right now is in this kind of conundrum of this inverted yield curve. And as we've talked about literally for, it's got to be nine months now. Let's look at that inverted yield curve. So here's the 10 and the two. This is a monthly. So we have been inverted. I'm not going to count this first one that happened in April of 2022, but we have been fully inverted since july of 2022 so we are over a year right we are about what uh 15 months 14 months into inversion which we have not seen the lengths of that kind of inversion and, and this deep as well so I, i'm not exactly sure how we get out of it but looking at this dynamic yield curve the only thing i can think of right now at least in the next 12 months is that the long end of the yield curve will start to tick back up and we'll see this tenure get back to four six four seven five percent right the chart that we've been looking at here here's your 10 year, would indicate that, right? It kind of feels like we're surging up there on that 10 year and we could very easily see it get to that 5% mark in a very short window of time. I, I do think that, um, you know, that 5% could be achieved easily by the end of the year. I know it sounds crazy, but it could, particularly because we have $33 trillion worth of debt and the government needs to service that debt. They're borrowing and issuing 10 year bonds to raise money to pay for that debt. Marcus says, didn't Bill say that the Fed had problems, the two-year auction, and that they had raised the yield in order to sell the bonds? Um, I don't remember exactly, Marcus. I remember he was talking about they did a double auction for the 10-year in one day because demand was really good, and that kept the yields down, which I thought was rather interesting, right? Why, why would demand be so high for the 10-year when the yields are so much better in the short term? That's something, uh, a conundrum I just can't answer in my head. We'll have to get Bill Addis on the program for that one. Tom says, uh, when gas is up 200%, a restaurant food is up over 100%, do 
do the tiny Powell movements that don't have an impact for 12 months really matter? In the grand scheme of things, they do. So the tiny increments, I mean, because the, the, the cost of capital impacts so many things, it literally impacts everything, right? Whether you're a consumer buying a car, whether you're a mom buying groceries, whether you're a, um, an automobile maker buying infrastructure or buildings or plants or facilities, whether you're a government issuing debt, those rate increases impact every single person. And I don't, um, I don't, uh, what do I, I'm at a loss of words. Uh, I don't envy Jerome Powell having to make those decisions. And while you're right, the 25 basis points here and there doesn't seem significant, but because it impacts so many pieces, they can't just say, hey, we're going to raise, you know, 100 basis points today, right? That would be too much of a shock to the system. So the only way to really do this successfully without creating that crash landing, right, where they want a soft landing is you have to slowly raise, check and see. Okay, we're all right. Slowly raise, check and see. And they've been doing that more and more and more. But, um, you know, there, there's so many different data points of which I don't believe all the data we're seeing is transparent and truthful. Um, but you're right, Tom. The, the goal of raising those rates is to actually slow down the rate of gas increases and to slow down the rate of restaurant prices, partially due to the cost of goods and services, but also the cost of capital to us as consumers. We don't have as much money to spend, right? So we might go out less. Is there any effect on the dollar um, with rising 10-year yields? Yes. In my mind, absolutely. Think about it. If you are Japan or China and you're now saying, hey, I want to lock in some of my money, get maybe 4.5% because, you know, the Chinese or Japanese bonds aren't yielding that much. If we look out there at different rates around the world, let me see real quick. I think I can bring this up for you guys if I go to Forex Factory's home. Uh, right on the front page, they have, oh, I blocked all my ads. Dab and it. Let me see if I can click on this real quick. Bear with me. This is where I want TJ. TJ, help me. Um, there is a table where you can actually see the yields. There it is. So this is at Forex Factory. Um, you can see over here on the left-hand side of your screen, you know, whose bonds do people want to buy? Well, it's not, it's not going to be the Swiss franc, which is a 1.75. If you want to get yield on your money right now, you look at New Zealand, which is 5.5%, and you look at U.S. dollar, which is 5.5%. And I think most would, pro even though we, we have issues with it, I think most of us would agree that you probably have a little bit more faith because A, we live here, and B, I, I know the, the process a little bit more in buying the USD, right? Buying those 10 years. So yes, um, if you are an outsider, let's say China wants to go and buy, actually, let me rephrase that. Swiss franc right now is 1.75, right? They could sell bonds at 1.75% when they sell those bonds to whoever buys them, they take those Swiss francs, they convert them into US dollars, and they now buy US dollars making 5.5%. So in essence, the Swiss franc can make 3.75% on an arbitrage spread between the US dollar and the Swiss franc. So what I'm getting at here, Dwight, is yes, um, governments and central banks around the world, should they choose to buy these 10 years, they would go out there, um, they could go out there and convert their native fiat currency, let's say it's yen, convert that into dollars. Now they're buying dollars, which creates demand for the U.S. dollar, and they can buy our U.S. government bonds. So yes, it drives the demand for the dollar. And let's take a peek at what's going on with that dollar index because it does tie into that. You know, we have had a, a pretty significant dip here on the monthly, but take a peek at our daily, right? It's starting to look beautiful yet again. We're breaking 106. My target on that was 106.20. Uh, we are hit a high today of 106.09. So getting real close to my target there, and I don't remember exactly why I had that target line on this screen, but be honest, but I got a lot of lines on here. Uh, but our next level, move it up here, is going to be right around 106.86. You know, and, and if that does continue on up there, oh, that certainly has an impact on our broader financial markets. Now, today was an anomaly. If you look at what happened, the dollar was surging today, right? Nice move up in the dollar, 0.35%. You had the 10-year today, big surge up, nice big green candle, broke through that 450 mark. Both of those should be bearish for the markets, and lo and behold, what happened? S&P was up 0.4%, uh, Russell's up 0.46, NASDAQ up 0.44. The only one that was kind of uh, the dog today was the Dow, which has a giant hammer formation, by the way, for anybody who looks at my chart pattern. So um, it was a little bit of a conundrum for me because I just didn't see the markets correlating like they are supposed to do. 
But as you all know, my favorite mantra, everything works until it doesn't. So those longstanding correlations, they don't always work. Uh, majority of the time they do, but they don't always. Energy has a much bigger impact on everything. Um, I would argue that the bond yields actually are a bigger impact on the on the overall markets, um, but without question, energy is extremely important in so many things that we do. All right, so at this point, you know, we it's just looking at that price chart of that ten years, the one that I'm really keeping my eye on because that trend is strong. I don't see anything really to stop it anytime soon. You know, again, you got that five or four point seven, call it four point seven mark, which is coming up about twenty basis points in front of us. After that, I think you got a pretty smooth sailing to five and a quarter. So be careful on that one. Um, I'm seeing fewer homes being sold. It was a flipper's dream over here, actually, in my neighborhood. A lot of houses being bought and flipped, um, making some good money there. But you know, the higher those rates get, the tougher that that niche market is all right what did i have here all right so you know on friday i did a little bit of just kind of running through some of the things that i was looking at and i think i read off like five or six i made no trades today woke up too late i overslept today so things happen um but i actually think that there's an even better out of i think i said six or seven things on friday that i was looking at um tim mentioned one of them so i'll talk about that in just a second but uh there's two that were on my list from Friday, which look even better today. And based off of one of the discussions we had on Friday, I did sell some puts today. Drum roll, please. You guys are going to hate me. I sold puts on Target. I'm okay holding Target long-term TGT. So here is TGT. I sold the 105s today. And let's just, you know, this chart looks horrible. And uh, unfortunately, uh, Michael's not here today. Michael loves to tell me about penny stocks and ask for thoughts on penny stocks. As you guys know, I don't touch penny stocks. But I think Target's a pretty solid company. I think they made some mistakes. I think that that still is an addiction for a lot of people who need, uh, you know, emotional shopping. People love to go to Target and Walmart. Now we had the comment, I believe it was from Tom on Friday, saying, "Look, Walmart, you know, that's that's where you just you go and you just grab stuff. Whereas Target, you kind of cruise around a little bit. And it seems like Walmart um, definitely has much more people in it. I, I'm a, I'm a beta tester of one by going into these stores all around me." Uh, but I'll tell you, the Santa Ana Walmart, be careful. <laughs> it's crazy. With so many lines in your chart, you're starting to look more like Samson. Oh, please. Oh, I, So I, I made a mistake over the weekend. Um, as you guys know, I think that he's a total shyster. Um, he keeps posting all these motivational tweets, and he knows nothing. He knows only two things, supply and demand. He can't talk about anything else. You ask him about anything else in the market, I don't know what you're talking about. He's got, you talk about one trick pony. So he says, uh, he tweeted out like, oh, um, if I start doing YouTube videos, you know, how many uh, would you guys want to see? And I'm like, I wouldn't watch anything that you talk about. And of course, a whole bunch of people tweeted out angry, angry treats at me for being hostile and angry. And I'm going to unsubscribe, unsubscribe and unfollow you because of that. Do your homework. Just do a little bit of research on the guy and you'll understand why I have a disdain for him. It's all the information that's out there on the web. Go for it. So let me go to this one. Um. You've got that big downtrend, right? Normally, I would say stay away from this one. You want to ride this trend to the short side. However, if I look out here, I was looking over at this these kind of low points that go back into March of 2020. So let me just zoom in here. We'll take everything off the screen and go right to there, right? There's your 108. I was looking kind of in this, this low point right here is 106. And if I'm going to use this as my kind of demand zone catalyst and a sp to a spike to the upside, um, I looked at the 105 and I'm like, you know, I'm fine owning at 105. And I sold them earlier today. Actually, Target had a nice rally after that, which is fine for me. I sold the, oh shoot, what, day, what did I send those for? Hold on real quick. I have it the app on my phone. I will tell you which strike, because now you guys keep asking me what strike and what everything. Um, so I did the October 20th 105s and I collected a buck 12 on those, which isn't great. Um, you know, it's it was over 1% for the month on something I was actually okay to own anyway. So uh, there you go. I just wanted to share that trade with you in full disclosure because I actually trade. Now, on that one, yeah, Josh, of course premium has been picking up. Why? Because look what's been look what's been happening to the price over the past few days. Tanking. You know, it's gone from 124 down to a low today of 110. I mean, that's a $14 drop. That's like a 9% drop in six trading sessions. That's pretty savage. And when you have drops like that, premium obviously goes much higher and much higher and much higher. So um, I like this one and I feel even better about it today. So 
Look at the chart formation here. You guys know one of my favorite things is a hammer formation after an aggressive sell-off in price. I'll notice what we had here today. Right? Out of the last six trading sessions, or seven trading sessions, four of which have been aggressive down. So you got this pretty sharp sell-off here. You have a hammer formation today. I'm going to draw a line right across the top for anybody who likes to use my hammer idea. Uh, what you're looking for for tomorrow is an open anywhere below 112.75. All right, that's your number. If it opens up down below that and then starts to rally above it, then you can start your long position, but only if it opens down below it and then breaks above it. So uh, keep that one in mind. The other piece here that I was looking at for it was volume, but volume really wasn't much of a, um, a supporting factor here. You know, to make this chart formation here perfect, what made it better for me was if we had climactic volume. And today volume on this was, let's say, 5 million. It looks to me like its average is right around, you know, 4 million, three, three and a half to 4 million. Well, if today's volume was like 15 million, oh, I, I would, I'd get up way early and be sitting here ready to just fire off some big trades. But I'm going to have some alerts set tomorrow. I may actually go long the underlier tomorrow uh, to own some, own some TGT, but we'll see how tomorrow morning shapes up. But anyway, I wanted to share that one with you because this looks like a nice little setup. The only thing that's missing for me is that heavy volume. And we're not near any really strong demand zones, but uh, I'm okay with it. Big Ab says that TTT drop is related to the resumption of student loan payments, if you did not already know that. Yeah, you, got, you mentioned that the other day. Um, I'm right with that. I still don't think it's going to – I mean, I look at this on a monthly chart time frame here, which I know is one of the, the Bob Dunn preferred methods, and it looks like we're actually coming back into the regular uptrend. Or if you were to put a 200-period moving average on here um, and, and keep in mind what happened between 1997 and 2001 – omit this giant surge up to 261 to kind of keep that line going we're getting right back down to to normal levels um and student loan not eating up and discretionary spending so let me go here put a moving average on there do this as a 200 and i'm just doing this just to see i want to see the long term because if you kind of graph out that 200 period moving average uh, well, it's still a little bit a little bit high off that 200 period moving average, but getting close. 200 period moving average right now is around 88. So, well, we'll see, big gap. I mean, bottom line is it's and it sounds horrible, mean for me to say, but it doesn't matter whether you whether you agree with me or not. I I now put money on the line, and we'll see how this trade ultimately pans out. So, um, just wanted to share that with you because I know we talked about this on Target or on um, on Friday, and I thought, well, it looks a little bit better today, and I opened a trade, a new trade today. Um, not simulator like a lot of other uh, experts out there. I'm not calling levels saying, oh, I would have, should have, could have made a trade here. I actually have a trade on with real money, which is different than most people. Anyway, let me get that volume off of there. Let's get that moving average off of there and go back to our discussion. So the, one of the questions came through was from Tim. This was this morning. He says, watching CMA this morning and it didn't break your 41.54 line. Would you still take the trade if it didn't break? So let me go real quick and go and look at, uh, what was that one? CMA, Country Music Awards. This is Comerica Incorporated, and it was on a daily that we looked at it on Friday's session. Ah, uh, yeah. So there's your 41.54 line. You notice today, we, so we had that little hammer formation, which is what drew me to it. And I did make the point on Friday, I said none of these really scream at me, right? None of them look uh just phenomenal i actually like united health the, of them all and i'll show you here in just a second how what happened to united health but uh, yeah, on friday session we had the hammer formation look we have almost the same thing today so yes i would still consider the 4154 line in play uh you know the longer it goes sideways here the less inclined i'm i'm uh, the less strong i feel about that going long but you know I think it's okay to take a break above 41.54 tomorrow if it comes to fruition. Uh, didn't happen out there today, so good question, Tim. Uh, what else do they have? There was that one. Let, real quick while we're on it, let's look at United Health, UNH. Because remember, United Health was coming into an overhead supply level. We had it tiptoe into the middle of it before selling off a little bit. Well, today we gapped up and even a smaller, more definitive spinning top. So for you zone traders out there, let me uh, put a line across the bottom of this one today. I actually think that this is even juicier than it was before. Again, it has to meet the criteria, right? Just because I say I like this as a potential trade doesn't mean I'm taking it. It has to meet the criteria. And that criteria for me would be it opens up tomorrow somewhere above 506.63. If it starts to break down below 506.63, then you can commence, start building your short position. I'm not one that likes to go all in at the very beginning. I, I want to make sure that I'm right. 
So if it starts to sell off, okay, great. Gets below 506.63, starts moving more, great. That's feels, I'll feel even better about it. Um, and then I'll start to add some to it. If you look at this position here or this uh, chart, you know, where's your, your logical target? Well, it hasn't had a red day. There's really no point where it, it had an origin of a move until you get down around 480. Well, uh, that's 26 points away from, you know, it'd be about 5% move on United Health. So not, not too bad uh, opportunity there, but you have to wait for this to actually start to break down. And old Bob done. Anybody know? No, I was, I'm, I don't. I'm pretty sure it was heart attack. He was having some heart issues, so it was probably stress. Um, and what else did I have for you guys? Uh, I think Kraft Heinz hit because I got an alert today on Kraft Heinz, but I didn't, I didn't respond to it. So yeah, you can, and I'm fortunate I didn't. You can see the red line we had here. It actually opened up above 34.13. It had a nice sell-off, went all the way down to a low of 33.91. So would have been in the money at one point, and then all of a sudden came ripping back near the end. Um, so glad I overslept today otherwise i probably would have taken a loss on that one had i taken it but i did not take that trade so there we go uh, what else was there there were um bank of america also has a aggressive sell-off for the past two weeks you notice this whole move started with a shooting star back on september 14th it's been selling off ever since it has not had a green day until today and it's not even a green day it's just a green candle but it was down again so this is a pretty ugly one again i got a hammer formation I can look at volume, nothing there that's that noteworthy. And then question is, where are we coming into? And you notice we are coming right into these lows that go back into Jan or June of this year. So uh, while it looks like a big head and shoulders to me, for some of you who might be a little more aggressive, you know, there's an opportunity there with this one from a buying perspective on a break above today's high, which I will get my lines off the screen here and show you the high for today. Bam. You're looking at 27.64. So an open down below that and a rally above it. And I think you're in a, a decent position for that one. All right, so we went through most of them. Um, the Starbucks one didn't hit, right? I had Starbucks, I had McDonald's on there. These are both uh, Harami formations, but again, this is why I love having the simple rules. The fact that it gapped down and never came back above 94.31 makes it easy. It's a no trade. Same thing for Mickey D's. All right, so McDonald's had that bullish Harami formation after an aggressive sell off, gapped down today. Didn't break the highs right around 273 and change. So all in all, feel good about that one. And my eyes tomorrow will be on Target and possibly even Bank of America for tomorrow. And if, if the market starts to sell off, I'll be looking at United Health Group. So those are the three I've got my eye on for tomorrow. And uh, hopefully those will turn out to be something good for me as well. All right. It was funny. I saw one of the headlines today talking about um, Bitcoin and how it was one of the the, the big movers today, and I was like, what are you talking about? Um, it kind of surprised me because I look at the price of Bitcoin here. Let's go bring up Bitcoin, BTC. And there you go. Really not much going on. Um, you know, I, I don't understand why they brought this up on the media, but all in all, price-wise, nothing really noteworthy here for Bitcoin. There were a couple in the crypto space that had big moves, um, but they're really smaller market-moving ones, really small caps like uh, uh, GLMR. He had a 54 or 43% move up today. Storage, which is one that I just recently purchased, happy about that, up 13% up today. But Chainlink as well, one of my uh, larger holdings, was up 6%. But really, not a lot going on in that crypto space. Now, the other parts that are uh, interesting, I guess I'll start at the bottom. Then. Here's our Bitcoin. We just talked about that. Here's gold. Gold uh, did poorly today. Came right back down to the bottom end of that trend, the kind of wedge that I'm, our pennant formation I've drawn there. But you also had silver. Check out SLV today. SLV was ugly. A 1.76%. A nice about face. This is actually called an abandoned baby formation for anybody who's into candles. It's kind of, uh, it's where it gaps up, leaves a little uh, cluster or one or two candles, and then just gaps the other way and leaves it completely untouched. That's a, an abandoned baby. Very bearish pattern there on the second candle here. Uh, we'll see where it goes. As you guys know, I did sell 2150 calls and, uh, sorry, $22 calls and 2250s against my current positions on SLV. So happy I sold those. Crude oil, dun, 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 looking very similar to that dollar chart, looking very similar to that 10 year chart, just keeps surging and surging and surging. And this goes back to our discussion we had about OPEC, OPEC plus, Saudi Arabia, Russia. You know, uh, Russia definitely zero interest in increasing production. They're going to keep cutting production and driving the price of oil up as high as possible as a, a middle finger to the to the West, I'm sure. Um, yep, you can call it oil universal. Yep. Exactly, Margaret. 
Band of Baby, Island Universal, very pretty much the same thing. Um, so where are we going here with crude oil? Looking at the picture, it doesn't give me any reason to think that we're not going to be going higher. Although, you know, you look down here from the origin of this last surge that we had up on September 12th, so just, you know, three weeks ago. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be too surprised to see a pullback down to those levels. But right now, still looking great. If this does continue, then uh, it does keep on track with my forecast for it being $100 by the end of the year. Uh, right there is your $100 mark. And from current levels, for those who are um, we're following along, that is an increase from where we are right now. It would have to increase about, come on. Oh, never mind. I don't, know, I don't know where that line came from. That one was way off. Let's go draw another line here just to see what that increase would be to get us to $100 by the end of the year. You're going to increase about 11%, which for crude oil, you guys know that could happen very, very quickly with crude oil. So crude oil, uh, was down 0.39% today. Still bullish on it. I think it's still uh, giving us reasons to want to go long by that nice uptrend. Uh, we talked about the 10-year breaking through. The dollar index as well looking great. You're about to hit that 106.20 mark. And then it was all podium today for the indexes. S&P up 0.41%. Notice the hammer formation. So we ended Friday very bad. And... Like I mentioned, anything can happen over the weekend. Sentiment is twisted around a little bit, and all of a sudden you had a nice little positive day today. Not not massive, but 0.41%. It was pretty much the same for all the three indexes. S&P was up 0.41% to 4378 as we speak. NASDAQ was up 0.44% to 14,935. Again, also with the hammer formation. And then the Russell was the best performer up 0.46%, closing right at 1800 for the RTY futures. So that is our markets. That's our overall stuff. Uh, let me go to this quick one right here. Uh, question real quickly from Les, who's, was he the first one today? You might probably pretty close to being the first one in the room today. Um, from Cape Canaveral, Les says, as we approach the end of the month and the end of the quarter, what might we see in the way of special trading? Will fund managers do more selling of stocks that have not done well? Will they do more buying so they can say that they own the more successful stocks? Will we see more volume? Yes. Yes and yes. Um, actually, there's four yeses on here. So yes, you do start to see more special trading because these institutions, whatever their goals and objectives are, right? They've got a prospectus and things that they have told you that they're going to achieve. So certainly they would like to get rid of the losing positions. So they look better when they report. They also want to be holding the winning position. So you will see typically selling of the bad stuff and buying of the good window dressing, as they call it. Um, do I play that? I do not. Personally, I don't. I I got too many things I'm looking at when I'm trading to kind of go. Okay, end of the quarter play, but I do know some um, trading buddies that do focus on that, and there is the end of the quarter trade. They have specific dates they use. Um, I would try to bring one of them on, but uh, the one guy that I would want to bring on wants nothing to do with his face in the spotlight. So I told him I would never even mention his name. Um, but he's got it down. I can ask him about the specific days. But there's a, he's got a specific trade he makes, an end of the quarter, end of the month play, and he says, works like clockwork every time. Every time I look at it, it doesn't quite work for me, so I just stop looking at it. But yes, um, I do think you'll typically see more volume. I do think you start to see these hedge funds and just whoever's uh, the funds that are allocating things differently, making some changes to the portfolio, and we'll probably see that going in the, last, the end of this last week of the trading month. Okay, uh, that was it. I had two questions that came through, one from Les, one from Tim. We talked about the breaking of the bonds, which in this case, they're breaking to the upside, which may not be that rosy of a picture for anybody who's interested in the, in the broader markets. Again, the higher they go, the more pressure that puts on our markets going forward, and that may be a, a bad thing. Uh, as far as economic calendar, here is, could he come on as a mass guest? No, he doesn't, he doesn't like talking, period. I don't even think he'd want to come on the show if it was at a voice change or anything. He just doesn't like to talk. Like I can't even get him to talk in person about a lot of the stuff. So he's kind of a, just a weird, shy recluse, at least the guy that I know that trades the end of the month stuff the best. Um, granted, I think he's got some problems with his trading style anyway. We've had that conversation in the past. but uh, Let's see. So for today, you really didn't have much as far as economic calendar goes. Here's what you got for tomorrow. You can see Tuesday the 26th. A lot more for the U.S. You've got the case Shiller Composite 20 Home Price Index, which is very interesting. We've seen that number on an aggressive sell-off and go negative. Now the expectation is we're going to bounce back up to zero here. We shall see. 
Um, that, we, that would be a welcome sign for anybody who wants stability in the housing markets, which of course would translate into stability in the financial markets. If we continue to see these blue lines down below zero, meaning a contraction and prices are declining, then all of a sudden flippers are underwater. Anybody's buying right now is underwater. So this is uh, you know, a good sign to see it kind of go back up. But we'll see if it actually does come to fruition tomorrow. That's going to be uh, before the markets open tomorrow. You also have uh, two other pieces of housing data. You have the HPI numbers. You also have new home sales, which are expected to decline to the tune of about 15,000 homes lower than the previous month. But wait, there's more. You've also got the Richmond Manufacturing Index. You also have consumer confidence numbers. And uh, if you're trading the Australian dollar, you have CPI numbers coming out as well. So a pretty busy day for the U.S. markets with regards to economic calendar. Really, though, it's housing. So if you are looking at housing, you look at things like IYR. Um, IYR has not been doing that great. I thought, I thought it might be a better opportunity uh, for IYR, but I'm going to have to wait on that one. And then lastly, as far as earnings calendar goes, the only real big one for tomorrow is Costco. You have Cintas as well, but Costco is the one that most people are focusing on. So, um, wow, 37-minute show. This, am I actually going to wrap it up right now? I am. This is awesome. I, I'm... I'm, I'm easing you guys into a shorter show, a 30-minute program. Um, all right. Well, that's going to do it for me for today. I have a bunch of other things I need to take care of, so it's great. Um, we'll keep an eye on those two trades for tomorrow. The one, the ones that I'm most interested in for tomorrow are going to be Target, are going to be um, Bank of America from a bullish perspective, and then from the bearish perspective, I'm looking at United Health Group, but we'll have to wait and see uh, if, if you get follow-through for any one of those. I'm also going to release an article tomorrow, which you guys know about. Uh, it says, what is the possibility of Shibu Inu reaching $1. <laughs> I was bored. I couldn't think of another article <laughs> to write about. And I was like, that's the one I'm passionate about. So I decided to use Shibu Inu, my old crutch in the crypto space. So anyway, thank you guys so much. If you have comments, questions, feedback, send them in at tradermerlin at gmail.com. Uh, if you want a topic for the upcoming shows, thanks for uh, Les and for Tim for sending in those questions. And uh, send them on in. I'll get to those under any of the YouTube videos or at tradermerlin at gmail.com. Take care, everybody. I'll see you tomorrow.